Hi, my name's Pippa Brown and I'm part of the Northfield community and I also serve on the Sozo prayer team. So my discipleship journey started back in 1974 when I met a genuine group of believers who trusted God, lived authentic lives and who loved people. It was very attractive. They really were living life to the full and they had a contentment that made me quite envious. I didn't have it and I wanted it. I was helped consistently in my new relationship with Jesus through these people. I later found out they were navigators actually. And I can remember back in 1975 praying very specifically that I would know God personally in deeper and deeper ways, like my friends did. And that's been my experience over 46 years and I'm still learning to know God. It's a journey. So disciples, what is the origin of that word? You might be very aware that the Greek for that is mathetes, disciple. And that's from the, forms the root word for maths. But don't worry, I am not going to be talking about fractions or um, difficult equations uh, today. It just means to learn. A disciple is a learner. But interestingly, it's not just an academic learner. It's somebody who follows their teacher and who lives out and puts into practice what that teacher is showing them and doing. So back in Jesus's day, rabbis all had disciples and there were loads of them. Jesus was not the only rabbi by any means. And they all had some specific understanding of the Torah, the, the word of God at the time. And they all had specific practices of how they, how they lived that out. So apparently you could tell which rabbi somebody followed just because they'd hung out with this person for so long. They even washed their hands in the same way that their rabbi did. And you have to be around someone a long time to pick up traits like that, don't you? And that's what we're invited to do as disciples of Jesus, to hang around him so much that we pick up his traits. We, we learn how to love other people. And so, yeah, we're invited to follow him. We're invited to know him. We're invited to love him. We're invited to obey him just as he did with his father. He trusted he obeyed. He did exactly what his father said. So my understanding over these years of, of, of be, being a disciple is that discipleship involves two key principles, two movements, if you like. The first one is coming to Jesus. And the second one is going, going where he sends. So if we look at coming to Jesus, I just like to read out the, some verses in uh, Mark's Gospel. It's chapter one and it's verses 17 and 18. And it says to people who asked or who followed Jesus by the lake, they were fishermen. And Jesus says to them, come, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. And then later in another account in John's Gospel, some more disciples sort of hanging around Jesus and he says to them, come and see where I'm staying. And they went and they spent the day with Jesus. So there's this principle of Jesus saying to his disciples, to those who went to follow him, come, come, hang out with me, be around me. And there's also a, a, um, a set of invitations that comes a bit later when the disciples have been following Jesus and he invites those who are weary and burdened to come and follow him and learn. So I don't think it's just a one-off coming. I think the invitation to us is to come regularly and follow Jesus, to come afresh. And then going with him into the world to make disciples is an aspect of being fruitful, to work with him, to bring the kingdom in. So we're following Jesus and then we're living life to the full with him 
and we're going out and we're making a difference where he sends us. So Matthew 28 is the classic passage for this, isn't it? Verses 18 and 19. So it's, it's go and make disciples of all nations. But it's not just a going of location. If you look at the original, it actually means as you go through life and in the midst of what you're doing, Whatever that is, whether it's your normal job, whether it's in your family, whether it's amongst your neighbours, where you are, as you go, make disciples, pass on what you know of Jesus to other people. So this coming and going movements are essential and it smacks of freedom, doesn't it? Coming in, going out again. And I need to come to Jesus many times a day to be refocused and kingdom orientated. And then I need to obey the nudges that Jesus gives me to go out and pass on what I'm learning. So let's unpack a little bit more of what this coming to Jesus as learners, as disciples actually might involve. Of course, the reason that Jesus invited the first disciples to come and follow him and to spend time with him was not primarily so that they would wash their hands in the same way that Jesus did. No, it was so that they would trust him, obey him in the same way that he obeyed his father and trusted him. It's an invitation to intimacy. Now, you'll get the very wrong impression that I'm into Greek here, but... Both the Hebrew and the Greek words of knowing, to know someone, is the same word that you would use for sexual intimacy as well. So in Jesus' prayer in John 17 verse 3, Jesus pray, is praying and saying, This is eternal life, that they, my disciples, may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Eternal life is about knowing. It's about that intimacy of hanging out, of being with, of being known and of knowing. So my drawing close to Jesus is all about that sort of learning. That's the essence of discipleship. Learning that I'm loved, learning that I'm totally accepted, learning that I'm valued and if I can learn increasingly to get those things from God, then I'm not going through life expecting other people to meet those needs and ending up disappointed when they don't quite approve of me or ending up failing at something when my whole identity has been based around achievement. It's vital that we come to Jesus and know that we are loved and secure in that. One of the key verses that's helped ground me in this comes right in the beginning of the Old Testament, really, in Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 12. And I've made this personal to me, so I've learnt it as though God was speaking this to me. Um, you can check out where it actually comes from. But it says, let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him. He shields her. All day long, the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. That's a beautiful image, isn't it? And there are many times when I've felt threatened or vulnerable where I've had to cling on to that verse that I'm the beloved of the Lord, that I can rest secure. I don't have to be knocked off, of course. Now, the actual living that out is different and it's a challenge, but it is a verse that helps anchor me and ground me. And of course, the big three are some of the primary ways that we can develop habits that will help us cultivate this intimacy, this reading of the Bible, praying our thoughts, guarding our hearts, just as Jeff has already mentioned on the Rooted course. So let's make that a habit that develops our intimacy with Jesus. The Bible's a primary way that we get to know God, obviously, and he's revealed himself both as the written word and through the living word. And I've found that if I want to be a learner, a disciple, learning to ask good questions is a really helpful way of growing. So even a basic question like, 
what does this bit of the Bible teach me about you, God? And then reading and thinking and waiting for the Holy Spirit to show me can really show me new truths. It can it can reveal great things. Asking a Bible passage. OK, God, what is this showing me about me? And then grappling with that because all sorts of things might surface as a result of that. So learning to ask good questions is part of being a disciple, I'd say. So asking of the Bible, but also asking questions of others, people that perhaps you notice around you who've got a dynamic walk with God, who seem to be vital, who are living life to the full. Ask questions. I can remember recently, um, I was feeling a bit overwhelmed by the number of people that I felt a bit responsible for or who had needs and um, were just pastoral concerns, I guess. And I said to this person, what do you do when there are so many people that you could pray for? And her answer was lovely, actually. It was very practical. I don't think she always does this and I certainly don't always do this, but she would write people's names on little bits of paper, fold them up and put them in a basket and she would lift this basket to God and say, Lord, you know all the needs of these people. I give them to you now. And I think there were one or two names that went in there that she particularly called her basket cases, actually. But that's not always honouring people. So we'll move on. We won't dwell on that. I think one of the other um, great ways that discipleship and freedom um, comes into play is learning to be vulnerable and to stop hiding, to stop hiding from God, to stop hiding from other people, sometimes to stop hiding from myself as well. To accept those flawed bits of me, those bits of me that have been damaged and hurt. And what stops Pippa truly relating in intimacy with God and help and stops her being the full person that God's made her to be. And I've become aware um, over recent years that I've got quite a lot of ways of defending myself. If I feel threatened, I'm more likely to respond with aggression. If a driver cuts me up on the road, then my response can be really quite aggressive and angry. And I'm realising that that's traced back to a route that was um, developed when I was a very little girl, actually, and my, my mum demonstrated a sort of weakness that I found very hard to be around. And I made this inner vow that I would never be weak. And I've realised that part of defending myself in, in a fairly strong way is all about me trying to protect myself in that, in that way and, and not demonstrate weakness. I don't want to be ripped off. I don't want to be taken advantage of. And I'm on this journey of learning how to not be so defended, but to let God be my protection. And one of the great tools and one of the great things that we offer here at Vineyard is Sozo Prayer Ministry. As I said, I'm part of the team. I've had a number of Sozos myself and I've been privileged to lead people and to experience some of the freedoms as they've realised where wounds have come from, working through forgiving people and finding that lies that we've perhaps believed for years and years, decades, can be replaced by God's truth. And it brings an, an enormous sense of freedom. It's marvellous. So let me encourage you to check out the Sozo website, which should come up on the screen now and will be available for you to investigate further. And alongside that, you might want to check out Peter Scazzaro's resources. He um, has done a lot of work about looking at emotional, healthy spirituality, and he produces a lot of excellent material. And again, the link will come up and be available for you to check out afterwards. I'd also just like to mention um, the question how do I best connect with you, God? Because there are lots of different pathways. And I've mentioned the Bible and we've talked about prayer in the past. 
but there are nine sacred pathways that have been identified and again there's going to be a link that comes up on the screen um, and it and it gives nine ways that um, different people are likely to find as their primary or secondary ways of connecting with God and what and for me one of them is connecting with God in nature being out amongst trees forests looking at the sea can bring me an intimacy with God that and connection with God that is really precious and probably doesn't do it for other people in the way that it does for us who have this particular pathway. So check out and just have a look and see if there are some other pathways that you might want to explore that might be a bit different. I suspect that most of us in Vineyard would come into the enthusiast pathway as well actually and, and love worshipping God with passion and with gusto as we sing and worship and get, get lost in that love and praise. <clears throat> so all these different things are aspects of how my discipleship brings freedom to be the person that God's made me to be and how I can be free to live life to the full. And I can't do this on my own. I have to do this in community with people where I'm receiving and I'm in a place to give as well. So this is part of the abundant life that God invites us to, that Jesus said he was, he was offering in John 10.10. 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. <clears throat> so in conclusion, discipleship is about learning. It's learning who God is. It's learning to develop an intimacy with him. It's, in, it's learning to know him better. And as we come to him, learning to respond, to be obedient, to let him set us free from the things that might hold us back. I think there are twin tracks. I think this learning is learning about God, but it's also learning about who I am as well. And they need to develop in parallel. So to follow Jesus to live life to the full, to make a difference <clears throat> is all part of our discipleship. So discipleship is about learning who God is and what he invites us to do as we follow him, as we grow in intimacy with him, as we come to him and respond to him. He sets us free to be who he's made us to be and to represent him in our world. We are to be agents of freedom for others. So yes, we follow Jesus, we live life to the full, and then we need to make a difference. So part of the dynamic of going is graphically illustrated in the geography of Israel and the Dead Sea. If you know anything about that, that part of the world, the River Jordan, full of life, flows into the Dead Sea, but no river flows out of it. And the consequence is there is no life in the Dead Sea. And we need this coming and going because that's what brings life. That's a, that allows the life of Jesus to flow through me to others. More of the specifics of how you can go is going to be covered in the next bit of the Rooted course. But just as a little set of ideas, just think about the home that you're in the neighbourhood that you have, the work that you're called to do, your wider family relationships, being faithful in the small things. These are all ways that we go and make a difference in our community. And there might be a specific ministry that God calls you into. It might be prayer ministry. It might be practical serving, compassion. It might be listening to other people. It might be leading a small group. It might be learning to share faith with Jesus. It might be adding the blessing of administration to help lift the load for others. So this is discipleship. It's coming to Jesus. It's knowing him. And it's going wherever he sends us in our life into the world. Thanks.
in this session, we're gonna be talking about small groups and community. Now this is a really core part of life at Birmingham Vineyard and when we talk about um, living life to the full, uh, living with friends on purpose and freedom, like in our vision statement, um, it's honestly really hard to do the last two without the first one, isn't it? To live with purpose and freedom, but to do it all by yourself. Um, it's actually having friends, and I don't just mean surface friends, but really deep people who know you and know Jesus and can help you and support you and encourage you. Um, that's really what helps to hold up everything else that we'll do and that we talk about on this course. Now, following Jesus uh, isn't something we're meant to do on our own. Um, I'm recording this in autumn 2020, so we've all got used to being learning to do lots of things on our own that we used to do together. Um, in researching this, this talk, I was looking um, for statistics on how hard it is to climb Everest by yourself compared to doing it as a team. I figured probably it was much, much more difficult. What I found actually is that the Nepalese government a few years ago completely banned people from climbing Everest by themselves. You have to do it in a team because it's that difficult. And actually following Jesus um, for your whole life, decades and decades and decades, or wherever you're at now, um, with it and into the future um, in the world that we're in is extremely difficult. I imagine that it's harder than climbing Everest. I don't know, because I'm not a climber. Jesus didn't do it alone, did he either? That's probably the best um, argument that we've got. Well, he did take time out to pray and be with his father. And while you could say that the people he had around him, he was discipling and looking after, actually, he also seems to have drawn quite a bit of strength and friendship from them. Um, he really needs them when he goes uh, to the garden Gethsemane, for example. He seems to really need their support and help. Now, there's a proverb, uh, Proverbs 27, verse 17, talks about iron sharpening iron. And in fact, the whole chapter talks about um, the fact that good friends who will really honestly challenge you, uh, good friends who look after you and support you are better than really anything else yeah, um, in the world that you can have. Now, being sharpened doesn't sound particularly nice. That sounds quite painful. I'm not sure that I want to be sharpened. But this looks like actually this is obviously what God is really calling us to do if we're called as Christians to um, follow Jesus to become more like him to do the stuff that he did um, and to end up being being like as like him as possible this side of the, the coming kingdom um, then we need some real help to do that and I don't think we can get there completely by ourselves I've got a friend uh, for example who she comes from a very different church background to me and so we always have these brilliant discussions where I've thought about something, a, a topic or a, a bit of the Bible or, or a practice that we do or something. And I've thought it through and I'm pretty sure I've reached a really good conclusion about it. And then I'll come talk to her. And actually, she has completely different ideas to me. Um, and she's also really thought them through. And she also uh, has can read from the Bible about it and, and really studied it sometimes. And so we have these discussions where sometimes I think I'm probably, I come out thinking I'm probably right. Um, sometimes I come out thinking I'm probably wrong. And sometimes we actually reach a conclusion that wasn't quite what either of us was expecting. Now, this happens with stuff about practice and about church, but it also happens with things about what do I do with my life or what decision am I making right now? Um, small stuff and big stuff, um, stuff that's obviously God-centered and then stuff that maybe isn't quite as obviously God-centered, like what should I do with this thing at work or how should I parent my kids or what should I do in this situation with a friend? Actually, having other people's perspectives, other people's experiences of God um, is extremely helpful. The New Testament in Thessalonians says that we prophesy in part and we know in part because the perfect hasn't come yet. Now in Thessalonians, for example, in the Bible, it talks about um, us prophesying in part and only knowing in part because the perfect kingdom hasn't come yet. Um, and so actually what that means is that we need each other, don't we? If, if I can only know a little bit of what God's doing and sometimes I get it wrong and you only know a little bit of what God's doing and sometimes you get it wrong and so does he and so does she, then actually if we all get together with the Bible and with, with our sensible heads screwed on and we all talk about what we think God might be saying, we'll probably be able to come to a really good conclusion together. And that's actually what I found when uh, we lead as teams, um, we, we try and make sure that any, any ministry, any area, any church does have a, a team of people speaking into its leadership. Um, and, and that we also have people speaking into our lives. Now, 
we're not just sharpened by by the work of others. Um, I think we're at our best. We're at our most free and most powerful. We live the purpose that we're really called to. Um, not just when we're being served and sharpened, but actually when we are serving and sharpening others, when that, that thing of, of team and friendship and mutual help is happening. Um, someone likened faith to breathing in and breathing out. Obviously, if you've just done a big marathon, oh, you'll need to breathe in a lot. And it might be that there are times in your Christian life where life's been really difficult and you just need to, to, to breathe in, to be fed and to be helped for a little while. But unless you relatively quickly actually start to breathe out again, you're only going to get so far with that, aren't you? Um, faith is meant to be that sort of taking in, being with God, growing yourself, but then also growing others. And actually, some of the growth for us comes from that. So, for example, um, there was a guy who came to our small group. Um, he'd been coming for a few months and every time he came, I mean, he clearly got something out of it because he kept coming, but he would sit in the corner of the sofa and he'd he'd be sort of hunched over and he, he would kind of be quite grumpy. Um, either he wouldn't really take part or he would, but in a kind of a grumpy way. Um, he didn't pray out loud. He didn't necessarily talk about anything that was very, very deep to him very often. And he'd had, I mean, he'd had a really difficult couple of years. He'd had a really horrible experience with the previous church. And so he was kind of healing and, and growing um, internally. But in, in the group, he wasn't, he, he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't the most easy member of the group to have there. Anyway, um, one evening, uh, a lady comes along to the group who had come to church on the Sunday before. Now, she didn't have a huge amount of experience. Um, I'm not sure she'd been to many churches before. Um, she wasn't a Christian, um, but she'd read a lot of, quite honestly, she'd read a lot of quite weird stuff on the internet. And so she comes along and she kind of sits and we have a kind of tea and cake together. And then um, we we start talking and and she starts asking questions and talking about stuff. Now, Honestly, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd tried everything with this guy in the corner. Um, I tried like my best Bible studies and my best prayers and, our, we, you know, we'd, we'd had our best kind of, tried our best kind of worship times and all this stuff, trying to, trying to connect this guy, reconnect this guy with his faith. But this, le this lady starts asking questions. He starts sort of sitting up and becoming really animated. Um, and then he's, suddenly he's kind of answering her questions, but he's also asking her things that kind of draw her out. He does it. He does it really graciously and really lovingly and compassionately. Um, he's very truthful. He's kind of fun. And we see this whole side of him that we just didn't really know was there. Um, and by the end of the group, um, when, when everyone kind of left, uh, my husband and I kind of said to each other, that's, that's just, it was, it was really noticeable that there was a massive difference between, between him before and then him in this space where he was like there's someone here that I can help and I can support and I can look after and who needs me um and actually not only had he helped her but his faith had clearly kind of come alive and and actually that was a bit of a turning point for him honestly um he'd never quite went back to to sitting in the corner of the sofa not really talking again um and that's actually who we are we're called to be aren't we we're we're called to to receive and to grow and to to be fed but we're also called to do that for other people, aren't we? We're called to be people who look after each other. And I think we find often our, our growth and our own faith and our own gifts growing and strengthening when we use them, when we look after other people. So I keep mentioning small group and probably it's worth saying something specific about that because small group for us at Birmingham Vineyard is, um, hopefully it's the place where you get um, a lot of your discipleship where you are known um, and you get to know other people really, really well. Um, there's, there's, so a small group is like, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with that, other churches might call them midweek groups or Bible studies or cell groups or whatever. Um, we just call them small groups. Um, the name really doesn't matter particularly. The, the point of it is it's not like a tick box exercise, like I've got to go to a small group to say I was a good Christian this week. Um, the point is that you go somewhere where you build relationships with people so that they know you and you know them well enough to be honest, well enough to be honest about the fact that actually you really struggle with something or you're struggling with some doubt or that you've got questions. Honest enough to say, actually, I want to see this happen, but I never have, or, or I want to be like this with Jesus and I don't know how to. Um, where we can be honest enough to challenge each other and to give advice to each other and to take it when someone else does that to us, which actually requires a little bit of trust, doesn't it? 
small groups, if they're done really well, and if we are known and knowing other people, they're places where we can flourish. They're places where our faith can grow. Um, you can also use your gifts at a small group. You might lead a Bible study if you've never done one before. You might lead worship. You might lead a time of prayer. Um, if you've done that quite a bit before, you might find that you're able to teach and lead other people and, and help them to do it. And actually, you'll find a huge amount of, of blessing and growth and connection with God uh, through that as well. The Bible says, don't neglect meeting together. And I'd have to say that if you aren't yet in a small group, um, give it a go. Uh, do maybe just commit, like find one that you can go to and then just commit for a few months and say, I'm going to come every week for a few months and just see the difference it makes. Now, our small groups are also organised into something called communities. So a community is really um, a cluster of small groups. So kind of organised around a local area. Um, so if your small group's like 10 or 15 people, your community might be four or five groups. It might be sort of 40, 50 people. Um, and these communities firstly exist uh, to, to help each other, to support each other pastorally. So the leaders of the small group will kind of be accountable to the other leaders in the community and they'll be able to share their struggles and get their kind of input and help as they serve other people. They'll get that um, from their community and their other leaders um you'll also be able to go to the to those people if you have a bit of a, a longer issue or something that's going on with you that you need a little bit of extra help with often the community leaders or, or other people in the community would be able to do that we also uh lots of our social stuff happens in communities that's a really nice size of group isn't it to have a party or a kaylee or a pub quiz or um something else that's really really fun and at the social stuff it's where you can meet a wider group of Christian friends, but it's also where you can invite people who aren't yet part of church, um, because that's also who we exist to serve, isn't it? As church, we exist to disciple each other and help each other, but we do that so that we can also be outward facing. We don't do it so we can face inwards and be comfortable and just think about us. We do it so we can look outwards and we can pastor our city and we can bring people who aren't yet following Jesus into church. Now, for some people some of my friends the idea of going to church on a Sunday is completely weird and they would not do that but they'd come to the pub and they'd come and dance at a Kaylee and they'd come and be part of a quiz um, and so like one community that we've got ran an event in the same pub every month uh, for several months and at the end of that they said okay we're going to run an alpha in the same pub an alpha course um, and actually what happened is that lots of people who are friends with people in the community um, or people who came to the pub started to come along to their events and like them and make connections and feel safe and maybe start to ask some questions, some of them about faith. And then off the back of that, they started to run an alpha course. And some of those people found that that was a good place to go because it's almost like a small group. They could talk about um, what they thought and bring their questions and stuff. And then we saw some real fruit from that. And some people added to the people of God, added to the church, people who decided to follow Jesus through that. So communities are our spaces of pastoral support and um, our social fun stuff. But they're also real spaces of mission, um, which both of those first two things make possible. And again, mission might look different in different local areas. So we've got a guy in our um, community who loves going out on the streets and talking to people about Jesus. And so he takes um, a few people every month and he goes and he talks to people about Jesus and he prays for them if they'll let him and he invites them to church. Um, then we've got other people who will set up like a community stall, at, like if there's a local park festival or something like that, they'll do that um, every year and they'll just be a presence and they'll run a game and they'll talk to people and invite them to church and all that sort of thing. So communities are our spaces where our small groups can be missional um, as well as pastoring and looking after each other and growing each other. So in sum, if you are thinking about being part of Birmingham Vineyard or you are part of Birmingham Vineyard, then do you get involved in a small group? Um, be known there don't just go along but be known be available serve there grow there lead there um it'll grow you in faith and as a person and also get some deep christian friendships it might be that as well as small group you need one or two or, or three people that you really let get under your skin it doesn't have to be masses of them but god wants to work doesn't he on our on our inward being on our secret heart and actually that's quite that's that's between him and us but it's also something that's much easier if we have other people, again, other people's perspective, other people's prophesying in part and knowing in part, other people's understanding um, that can help us connect with God um, in our inmost being. So 
that's where God wants to work. So I would definitely say get some deep Christian friendships, even just a few of them. Allow people to get close to you, um, which can be hard for some of us who've struggled or, to trust in, in previous relationships or, or with past experiences. Get some great Christian friendships, be part of a small group and be part of a wider community because we want to be a people who are discipling and looking after each other, growing in our gifts and serving, but also who are outward focused and welcoming those outside of church, um, even if that's just to a party or something as a starting point. Okay, um, thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the course. My name's Jo. And I'm Cap, and we're site pastors here at Birmingham Vineyard. Yeah, we're absolutely delighted to have been asked to talk to you about the Holy Spirit because he is one of our favourite subjects. I say he because he's one of the three persons of the Trinity, although we could just as well say she because God is not actually of any particular gender. He's both because both man and woman have made in his likeness. But we use he because that's traditional. He's absolutely essential uh, if we want to live our lives in the fullness of all that God has created us to be. So we're going to start with what our core beliefs about the Holy Spirit are, all of which are based on what the Bible says about him. Then we're going to look at how he comes into the Bible, then how it is that uh, it, how that is reflected and manifested in our lives. Yeah, and in the church. Yeah. Yeah. We believe that God is three persons of one substance, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, all of whom are equal in power and glory. The Holy Spirit is the person of the Trinity who comes and interacts with us, convicts us, points us to Christ's salvation, comforts us, counsels us, guides us, empowers us and inspires us in our worship of God and our living of kingdom lives. In other words, he helps us live our lives uh, to the full. Yeah. Uh, we believe that the Holy Spirit brings the permanent indwelling of God to all believers. And, and, and it's God's desire that we're not only baptised by water, but also baptised by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When he fills us with his power and gifts us for our personal sanctification, for building up and strengthening of the church and for the expansion of his kingdom. We believe that the Holy Spirit, that the, with the filling of the Holy Spirit, we are given the power and boldness to proclaim mm. the good news that Jesus brought to the world and to do all the miraculous things that Jesus did under his authority. Yeah. Now, we first see the uh, first mention of the Holy Spirit right at the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis 1 verse 2, it says... Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So the Holy Spirit was there right at the beginning and we see the Holy Spirit coming and filling people in the Old Testament. The first example of this is in Exodus 31, uh, 1 to 4, where we see that God tells Moses that he has chosen Bezael um, uh, and has filled him with the Spirit of God with skill, ability and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for, for work in gold, silver and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work it in wood and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Yeah, so basically God 
filled um, an artisan with his Holy Spirit so he could create beautiful things for the, for the uh, tent of meeting. In the Old Testament, we see that the Holy, Holy Spirit filling specific people for specific reasons. Mm. We sometimes see that the, the, the Spirit of God withdrawing from people. Mm. Take Saul, for example, in 1 Samuel 10.10. 10. Uh, we see the Spirit of God came upon him in power and he joined in their prophesying. But by 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, we see the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. Yeah, that's right. But God promises in Joel 2, 28, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Mm. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And we see those days come in the New Testament. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is right is, is there right at the beginning of the New Testament. In Matthew 1 verse 18, we see that Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit, which uh, is why we see uh, Jesus as both human and divine. Uh, but even Jesus uh, is specifically anointed for mission. Yeah, that's right. Once he has been baptised by John with water, we see in Matthew 3.16 that heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a, a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I love and whom I am well, with whom I'm well pleased. Um, and Jesus is aware at that point that he is filled uh, with, with power and authority. Yeah, Jesus also claims himself that the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has appointed, uh, anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Yeah, and Jesus empowers and authorises his disciples to do those same works that he does, that he is called to do. But when he speaks... Um, to them about his death, he promises them that when he goes away, the counsellor will come to them. And when he's talking about the counsellor, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, and we see at the beginning of Acts, the resurrected Jesus tells his disciples that they need to wait in Jerusalem because in a few days, they're going to be baptised with the Holy Spirit. And this baptism is known as Pentecost. And we see this story unfold um, in Acts. It's a, it's a great story. Yeah, so I'll just read, read a bit of yeah. that. So when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under, the, uh, under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't, these all, uh, aren't, these, uh, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Mm. How, how is it that each of us hears them in our native, in our native language? Mm. We hear them declared the one we, we hear them declaring the one the wonders of God in our own tongues amazed and perplexed they asked uh, they asked one another what does this mean yeah it's amazing it's amazing supernatural phenomenon um, and the disciples then go on to perform amazing miracles yeah. and proclaim the good news about Jesus wherever they go um, and then we also see in the teachings in the New Testament, um, we see teachings on the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, we can see the Holy Spirit at work in us through, uh, through the fruit that is naturally produced by his presence. Mm -hmm. uh, in Galatians 5, 22, we see that the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. These qualities are produced naturally as we pursue like Christ likeness and give our lives over to God. Yeah, and joy. You missed out joy. Oh, don't, joy. Don't, don't, don't miss out joy. <laughs> um, we're also given specific gifts from the Holy Spirit, um, many of which are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, where it says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. 
To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge. To another, faith. To another, gifts of healing. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. And to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to another, interpretation of those tongues. It says, all of these are the work of one and the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Yeah, we're told that in chapter 14 to eagerly desire these gifts so that they can be used to encourage and edify each other and to expand the kingdom of God. Yeah, and these, these amazing supernatural gifts are not simply available to a few special people but are available to all mm. believers. We're all equal in the kingdom of God and everyone gets to play. The Holy Spirit gives us freedom, purpose and power to thrive in our individual giftings whilst working with others in our community to make a difference to those around us. So what does all this mean for us? Right now at this time in our church in Birmingham, in the 21st century? Well, as, as we said, we believe that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is available for all believers. Indeed, uh, we also see the Holy Spirit affecting people who are not yet believers. After all, the promise in Joel was that God would pour out his spirit on all people. This means that in our church services, we ask the Holy Spirit to come uh, and we expect that he will turn up and anoint us and allow us to prophesy, bring physical, emotional and spiritual healing speak in different tongues and other such manifestations of the Holy Spirit that we see in the New Testament. Yeah, we usually try to specifically make room for this to happen, often saying, come Holy Spirit, and we'll often wait expectantly for the Holy Spirit to come. When he does turn up, his presence can be felt in all sorts of ways, sometimes um, a, a deep sense of peace or a profound sense of being loved by God. You may experience God through a physical sensation like heat or tingling hands or shaking or butterflies in your stomach. Um, we had a yeah, great story, yeah, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, just, uh, just uh, as we've been praying over the last couple of weeks, uh, we, a lot of our small groups have been meeting on Zoom and uh, we were praying for one of the, the people in our small group and uh, she was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and was just uh, floods of laughter. Yeah. And she just kept laughing and laughing. And just God was just yeah, joy, just overflowing yeah. joy and happiness. And uh, I mean, we even had to put her on mute to continue <laughs> praying for other people. But God was at work in there. It was just amazing amazing time of just God just filling it. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, you can also experience God speaking to you in your mind and heart through pictures um, or words or feelings or impressions, either about yourself or about someone else. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I, I, I had an experience of this uh, at Kingdom Impact and uh, one of the conferences that we have and uh, I had a sense of, of uh, that I needed to pray for somebody and there was somebody who stood in front of me and um, I, I just had a picture in my mind of his hands were, were creative hands and, and just to encourage and bless his hands. And so I asked if I could pray for him, uh, this, this chap that I'd never met before from a, a, a different city. And uh, he, he, I prayed for him and uh, for his hands and, and, and that releasing of a creative anointing on him. Uh, and he, he at the end, after I'd finished praying, he just said he was really blessed because he, he he's somebody that works in the creative fields. I didn't know that. Obviously, the Holy Spirit was just putting something on me uh, and, and to just encourage to encourage him, him, which was really, yeah. 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 Um, we also sometimes feel prompted by the Holy Spirit, Spirit to pray for specific situations or conditions for healing and breakthrough. And we'll sometimes, when we're allowed, when it's not social distancing, <laughs> We'll sometimes lay hands on each other and pray for healing. Yeah, this often often happens at the end of the service to allow time for God to do what he wants to do. But it can also happen at the end of worship as worship uh, as worshiping God focuses our attention onto his presence and allows the Holy Spirit to work in us more overtly. Yeah, I had an um, amazing supernatural healing of my back. Um, I, when I was a, when I was younger, I used to suffer an awful lot yeah. with back problems, didn't I? Because yeah. um, when I was fourteen, I broke my coccyx, so it's the wrong shape at the bottom of my back, and the muscles get thrown out. And um, one time, I was in a lot of pain, 
and I've been given painkillers but I couldn't take them because I was working and driving and they fuzzed my brain. And I was in so much pain that I started to develop eczema with the stress of it. And then one day at small group, someone prayed for me and overnight the pain just completely went away. All the eczema healed up. The bone, weirdly, is still in the wrong place, but it just no longer causes me problem. For me, that is an everyday miracle. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've seen so many uh, miracles and answers to prayers through through the lockdown uh, period, um, doing online church and, and actually praying for people online. Uh, we've seen people with uh, toothaches and uh, problems with their eyes or, or, or earaches Please, and back yeah. pains, all healed when people have just been praying for them um, online. So it's really exciting that God is just using whatever situation we're in, even today, uh, to be able to heal his people and heal those that, that need. Healing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Seeing people physically healed or, or being set free from fears or things that have been binding them in front of our eyes never gets boring. No. Seeing the Holy Spirit work is never boring. Um, and for us, the presence and manifestation of the Holy Spirit is an essential part of doing church together. It's the power of the living God at work in us and through us. Um, and we even get excited about taking that that Holy Spirit power out into the community too. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Thank you.